and welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Venicia. This is the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast and today I am joining you for episode 24 of the Woolly Worker Knitting Podcast. It's nice to be back. It's been three weeks since my last episode and last week there wasn't even an episode. It was just a stream which was lovely by the way so thank you if you came for that. But yeah, um, basically I, I wanted to time this podcast episode release with the Rue sweater release uh, just so that I would have the photos in time etc. But I think it was a, a mistake because now it's been three weeks since the last episode and I have no less than 12 finished objects to talk about technically. Uh, but there's no way that I can do that. I don't think anybody wants to see me talk about the 12th finished object after two hours. I don't think I would say anything coherent. So um, I'll show you quickly the little pile of things that we have to talk about. Here's uh, There's two sweaters, the one that I'm wearing, a bunch of accessories, and then there's also a sweater that's blocking right now, which is also why I can't really show this. So we're gonna take things one at a time. If you're new here, I hope that this doesn't discourage you from uh, watching the rest of the videos. I usually don't have that many. January was just a huge month for finishing things. Uh, at one point I had eight works in progress, like active ones, not hibernating ones. And I was just thinking like, even for myself, eight was too many. So I really got into this mood of, of finishing them and not casting on to replace them. And it was really, really satisfying. And I was getting so much achievement, so much dopamine from just clicking the little finish button on Ravelry, weighting the yarns, saying how much the project used, etc. So it was actually really enjoyable and not at all restricting to be finishing items uh, instead of just casting on new garments. So yeah, I, I look forward to talking to you guys about all of that. I will try and keep it very concise. I will really try to talk about the important things about these projects. I want to mention the yarn, the pattern, the knitting experience and the fit of the finished object is kind of what I want to do. What I'm going to start with is what I am wearing and then the two other garments that I can talk about. Then I will talk about accessories and then afterwards if I have time and there's time left over for the video I will film a little separate segment that is all about gift knitting because three of the items here in my pile were gift knits for family members. Um, I know it's January, why was I gift knitting? Well, uh, I'll talk about that later. So that's the structure of the video. Uh, there will be chapters, uh, timestamps in the description below, as well as all the relevant information that you might need. And I'm also always happy to answer questions if you shoot me a message on Instagram or just a comment. I pretty much reply to every comment and have been for a year. Uh, and then while we're doing admin, yeah, if you uh, don't already follow me on Ravelry or Instagram, you can find me there at The Woolly Worker, same as here on YouTube. You can also find me on Ko-fi or Ko-fi where you can support me for just the price of a cup of coffee if you feel so inclined and you can also buy me a pattern on Ravelry from my wish list if you wanted to I guess uh, motivate me to knit one of those projects as opposed to others it's very motivating to be doing stuff that you guys bought me uh, a few of the projects here were received as gifts, the, the pattern. So thank you if you've done that. And you can also find me on the Woolly Worker Discord and the link for that will be below. So I think that's everything for that. And um, I don't think I'll be talking about whips pretty much because I've just like finished all of them. Uh, currently I have two things on the needles. One of them I cast on yesterday and the other is my red sweater, but there hasn't been much progress. So um, I think that's it. I'll give a couple of updates at the end if you want to stick around for that, but let's just get into what I am wearing. So you may recognize this or you may not because uh, it is missing a crucial element of the design feature. This is the Rue sweater by the Korea Bea Rebecca Klo. It was released this weekend on Friday. I think I'm posting this video on Monday as usual. It's a uh, contiguous shoulder so it kind of has this like saddle detail and then it continues with increases down in like a vertical shaped line and then there's a little bit of raglans here at the underarm and um, normally the pattern features some really nice color work at the yoke and Rebecca says that the contiguous construction method is really good because it allows you to have color work come up quite high up without having to knit flat and purl like you would in a drop shoulder so it's really nice to have 
this features mixed together, the contiguous and the color work. And then in her sample as well, it starts with the main color being green, there's white color work, and then this slowly transitions into green being the contrasting color and white being the main color uh, for the bottom of the sweater. So that's a really nice detail as well. We, uh, Rebecca kindly invited me to take part in the photo shoot for the pattern photos, so I will of course be spamming you here on the side with a lot of finished items photos. Uh, I'm really, really proud of them. I, I, I'm super chuffed with how I styled this jumper and the, the photos. I was much more confident this time around than the first time. Um, and I think that this color as well suits me better than the green I had picked in my last photo shoot for uh, the Crevea. So yeah, it's been a pleasure. I've been wearing this sweater a lot, I've been talking about it a lot, I've been sharing a lot on Instagram, usually I just kind of post a couple photos, but I've been spamming with this one. Um, yeah, I'd really be curious if you guys were maybe motivated by my unicolored version and wanted to make your own. Usually I'm like the one who gets inspired by people and then copy their modifications, so it would be really fun to be on the other side of the coin for once. So again, uh, let, let's keep it straight. So the, the the pattern is the Rue sweater and like I said, I highly recommend it. I think it's different than normal patterns or like the usual Crabbe patterns because it's not that it's difficult per se, but I don't think I would recommend it for a beginner because of a couple of reasons, especially if you decide to do the color work. And Rebecca talks about that in her podcast as well. So definitely check her out for more details on the pattern from like straight from from the designer but basically you're having to deal with um a more fitted design and it doesn't allow for as much mistakes or room for error as a raglan or drop shoulder would so if you don't get the fit right it might not like just you, you won't be able like it'll strangle your armpits for example because it's really fitted here in the yoke shoulder and armpit and bicep as well so be careful when you pick your size it's really important to look at the schematics and look at the measurements for the bicep instead of just assuming that the bust circumference is enough to continue and then if you're doing color work and your gauge is different mine is but usually the other way around i'm looser in color work a lot of people are tighter in color work so they might have to play around again, especially at the arm and the sleeve circumference with going up one or two needle sizes to make sure that the gauge of the entire garment is consistent and you're not having those big differences in like width of the body because there sometimes have been rows that are just plain stockinette, then there's rows that have color work and you really want it to be as like straight as possible because there's no body shaping past the yoke. So that's something to keep in mind. But other than that, I highly recommend jumping into the pattern. If you want to do the unicolor version, it was really, really easy to modify. Um, they were charts. And then you could just see kind of like at what rate the increases were. Like was it every other row? Was it every row? And just kind of continue. Like you didn't have to read the chart per se, but just use the chart to understand the, the rate of increases. And then for the sleeves, it's the same. I just counted how many decreases Rebecca wanted you to have in the sleeve, and I spaced these out evenly. Um, I used a tubular bind off for everything. Uh, I did my usual crochet pickup edge for the neck. There will be some detailed shots here on the screen, and I promise a tutorial is coming for that. Um, but if not, I'll link the written tutorial that I usually use down in the description below. I know a lot of you guys ask me about that, so yeah, it's linked in the description below. And then we'll talk about this just like in the future. <laughs> So that was for the pattern. For the yarn, I used the same yarn as Rebecca. I used the Fiberco Lore. I had used this before for a cabled vest and I really liked how the yarn behaved for cables. It had great stitch definition. It's wooden spun, so you get more meterage for your grams. And it's like a DK, but for me, it can kind of act as a worsted and you can use it with a wide variety of needle sizes and make it fit your gauge, I think. It's quite soft, it's not itchy. So it's not like merino soft, it's a little bit more rustic, but I, as you know, am sensitive to wools and mohairs and I've been wearing this no problem. I have been wearing a layer underneath, either long sleeves or just a tank top, and honestly, like, I'm fine. The neck doesn't come too, too high either. The wrists are fine, so all the sensitive areas are covered, and especially if it's really cold, like it was during the photo shoot, then I wasn't feeling any uncomfortable feelings at all. So I really like the yarn and Rebecca says that it's really good for color work as well because it blooms. So if you have any inconsistencies or tension issues or gaps in your color work, everything will settle nice and nicely. The yarn is really round and I guess the only thing I wouldn't recommend this yarn for is lace, I guess, because it is on the rounder side. Um, it has really nice colors. As you can see, this blue is just stunning. It has a lot of depth to it. It has little bits like specks of 
white and black or gray in it. It's like a silverish blue. It's really beautiful and um, yeah, I, I also recommend checking out the other testers versions, especially if you're wanting to get some inspiration for like which colors to pick for your one. Do you want high contrast, low contrast? Some people have not done the duo color thing and then they've just gone for one main color, one contrast color and the main color stays the same the entire way throughout and that's really nice. I saw someone use a 2x2 two two rib for the details and I really loved her version. Um, so yeah, uh, it was a pleasure again to test for Rebecca and to do the photo shoot. I, I had such a fun time and I'm so pleased with the photos. It is a privilege to be able to, to do that and to then end up on the um, product page. If I were to change anything, so for the fit, I guess I would maybe do, um, I would pick up less stitches for the neck. I think mine is a little on the chunkier side or I would also go down one more needle size than I did because my rib is just like so loose. Other than that, I'm super happy with the length again, you might see in the photos, I think it just hits me at a really nice point where it's not a cropped sweater, it's like just bang on regular length. I did crop it a little bit compared to what the pattern said, I put that all on Ravelry. And um, I am just so in love with this fitted construction. I think I'm still in the process of discovering my tastes and figuring out what I like and what I want to fill my wardrobe with, instead of always going with what's trendy. So I think if you've been on Instagram or even just on the Hot Right Now page on Ravelry, you'll know that big oversized sweaters are in and have been for a while. And it's not to everybody's cup of tea. And I thought it was my cup of tea. I really liked like, oh, I'm wearing my boyfriend's sweater and the sleeves are huge and um, I'm just so cozy. But actually, I when I wear something like this or when I wear my two fingering weight sweaters that just really hug my figure, I much prefer this and I feel much more confident, elegant, put together, cool, like I feel like my posture is better when I'm wearing something fitted and it wasn't until I started making these and, and realizing the big difference in how I feel wearing these that I am now trying to make a more conscious effort not to go for oversize. Um, and you will see in the next couple of garments I will talk about, they are very oversized and there's much more ease. And it just is it's such a different look. And it is totally up to personal preference. I'm not saying that one is better over the other, but making this sweater has really motivated me to seek out more fitted constructions or also do drop shoulders and do raglans, but size down instead of sizing up um, and, and not being afraid of negative ease, for example, especially when we're now coming to like summer months, like soon-ish. Um, I'm gonna have t-shirts, I'm gonna have camisoles. I quite like having a bit of negative ease. Um, so yeah, the, the fit of this has made me really happy. I'm super satisfied and I'm looking forward to finding more patterns that use this contiguous shoulder construction. I know that Petite Knit has a bunch of them. Um, Handmade by Florence had the Tombow T, which also has a little bit of a saddle shoulder. Um, and if you know of any other patterns that are like this, constructed like this, then let me know. I think Isabel Kramer also has a bunch. Um, okay, so I think that's it. Only one more thing. Uh, when you test for the Crabia, she kindly offers you a free pattern from her catalog. And I already have all the patterns that I want from uh, Rebecca. So I thought it could be nice to just do a tiny mini giveaway um, because I, I'm not going to have a use for the discount for the, the coupon that I get. So if you're interested in getting any of the Crabia's designs, patterns, then comment below and say um, which pattern of hers you'd like to get. This isn't endorsed by her or anything. It's just like my idea. Um, so if, if you want to get any pattern from Rebecca, it doesn't have to be this one, just comment below, say which one you would like, and then I will pick a random comment by uh, the time I do my next podcast episode in a couple of weeks. And then, um, yeah, I will contact you and then you can uh, get the pattern straight from Rebecca. And the total cost of this garment, very shockingly, I don't know if it's because I cropped it or my gauge or because I only use one color and there wasn't that many ends, blah, 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 but I only used just over three balls of the fiber company lore, which is really crazy because I think the yardage normally was at least four, maybe five, or like, you know, four and a half or something. But yeah, I, I, I managed to just use over three balls. So in total, and I had bought that one on sale. So the total cost for me was £44.64 which I'm super chuffed with. I like my garments to be under 50 pounds. That's kind of what I consider to be like my range of like what I'm happy to pay for for a sweater or a cardigan. And uh, the way that I calculate these, again, if you're new here, I've been mentioning the price of my sweaters since pretty much when I started my podcast a year ago, but I calculated by the meter because now I have 
almost one skin left over and then I'll see what that costs um, if I use it in like a hat or something. So yeah, this is the cost of, of the meters of, of what this project uh, ended up being. And I think I'd be really, really happy to, to see more versions of this coming up and I, I can recommend the yarn. Okay, so that was that finished object. Let's now talk about my other finished objects. And like I said, I will talk about the sweaters. So we've talked about this really nicely fitted garment that suits me and is really um, makes me feel confident. Let's talk about something that is not that great. And the worst part is that I didn't think it was going to be bad until I tried it on to take photos with my boyfriend yesterday and, and I realized like there's just a huge problem with it. It is my Sonia sweater by Petite Knit. So here it is. Um, it looks really good. Like it it, it looks fantastic. It's hand dyed and it's kind of like speckled hand dyed as you can see. Um, I used a grey yarn for the base. It was by Knitting for Olive Heavy Merino in pearl grey. I was hesitating between holding a white base and then the speckled Surrey Alpaca or using a grey base and a Surrey Alpaca and I swatched with both and I quite like the moody look of this as opposed to just like classic white and speckles. Um, and, and yeah, it's a drop shoulder, it has a lot of ease. The way that the back is constructed is just like one big... Mm, I think it is one big rectangle. And then you slope the shoulders with short rows. Sometimes you shape the back with increases, then you have this like trapezoid shape, and then you do straight shoulders. This one I think was a straight rectangle. And then it had the short rows later on. So here's the back and then I'll show you, but we took some details shot with Ross. So I'll show you the back as well in a close up. But here's what you can see. This is like the pickup edge, that diagonal line, which is really neat and straight. And I quite like it. Like it's not invisible, but it's really neat. And I think it's like a nice direction line to kind of break up the, the fabric. So I really like it and I'm proud of my pickup and, and whatever. Uh, the neck, I again did my little crochet pickup line, which I'm not a huge fan of on this one, actually. I think the neck is just way too small. I don't know what I was thinking. I omitted two rounds, so technically one round of height. And I don't know why I did that. Well, I was trying to save yarn, and then I ended up having to buy some anyway. Uh, but I think the neck, I would have been happier if it came higher, like this one. Definitely is a chunkier color without being, like, huge. Um, okay, you probably can't see right here, and I don't know if you're going to see in the photos because for some reason I was putting my hands over my body a lot when we took photos, so I don't really have a huge, like, nice clear shot of the entire sweater. But I tried so hard, and I talked about that in a previous episode, about... I, I tried so hard to marl the colors as best I could and avoid any pulling. And I kind of failed and there ended up being some pulling. So the way that I did it, I had three skeins of hand dyed Surrey from Nervous Fiber, by the way. And I split every skein in half. So I had six balls of Surrey. Then I mixed and matched them up so that like A was with B, B with C and C with A. Like I kind of did that so that it would all be mixed and, and, and randomized. And then I held it with the heavy merino and then I alternated skeins when I was knitting flat every other round and then I did helical knitting to alternate every round when I was knitting in the round. And I thought that by doing that like I had the best chance of, of basically never having a huge section of the same mohair or like the same alpaca in one section. Like by doing what I did I really thought that if one skin was different than the others, it would be really spread out throughout the jumper. And yet somehow I still have this big section on this side of my body that has a lot of speckles, a lot of dark speckles. That kind of like dark gray and brown is more prominent in this area than it is in the sleeves, for example. And it's not like I got any pooling per se, where you get this huge sea of the same color. I think it's more that the speckles are more concentrated in this area. And I don't know how this is going to come off on camera yet, so you might be seeing this and you might be thinking to yourself, what is she talking about? This is perfectly even. And that's fine if you think that, but I can see this thing in person. And when it is flat out on the floor, like I just threw it on the floor now, I can definitely see a dark patch. But that is not the reason why I am not happy with this project. I just really wanted to talk about this whole 
technique of, of marling and pooling, which was a huge headache. This was originally supposed to be a nice, mindless project that was all stuck in it, and I'm, I'm familiar with the construction. <clears throat> it has enough variation in the construction that I'm not bored like I would in a raglan, and it is a large gauge, 17 stitches, so it would be fast. No, none of that was true. It took a lot of planning, it took a lot of knitting time, because I had to do all the like color alternating and everything. And then I ran out of yarn. I was thinking a lot about whether <clears throat> to crop it or not. Um, because at this time I was kind of realizing I wasn't that much into huge oversized things. And also I was playing yarn chicken because this was an expensive project. I only had 900 meters of Surrey. And I knew that if I was going to do it full length, I was probably going to run out of yarn. And so I did run out of yarn and I actually ran out of merino. So I had to buy one more bowl of heavy merino. I bought it at my ivory room. Thank you, Valentina, for helping me out in a pinch. Um, and then I was able to finish it. And so yeah, it was a headache. It wasn't my nice mindless project that I had hoped. And I thought because it was a very expensive project that I would love this and would dedicate as much time as possible on it so that it would be a big payout. But unfortunately, and I don't know what happened, and I feel like such a beginner for it, like I'm kind of kicking myself for it, the sleeves are massive. And I feel like I've been saving this like as like a bomb for like the last, but you probably have been seeing in the photos, you may have been noticing that something is seriously wrong with this jumper. The sleeves are just like past my fingertips, like way past, like they're floppy over my fingertips. And it is a shame. Uh, they probably they, I, I tried it on before block and it was like, oversized sleeves, like past the um, thumb bone thing. Is that what people talk about sometimes, about like the length is the bone of the thumb, I think? So yeah, that's where the sleeves were. And then after block, it just grew so much. And it must have been because of the sleeve growing and then the shoulder drop dropping lower. There wasn't any super wash in this fiber content, so I don't know why it grew so much. And now we have a few different solutions. You may have seen in the photos, I've been styling it by folding the cuff over, which effectively basically gives me back maybe like 10 centimeters, uh, which is really nice and more practical. I need to weave in my ends better because I had some like ends deep in the ribbing, they're now exposed. So uh, I might do that and wear it around this winter and see what I f what it feels like and is that enough. Second option is to do some sweater surgery, remove, you know, probably 10 centimeters just before the rib and then graft the rib back. I never did this, I've never done this, but I'm confident I can do it. It really wouldn't take long. I could do it in one evening, I'm sure. And again, this might be a huge step towards making my knits more wearable, even though they, like, they have a big mistake, like just go back and fix the mistake, which is one of my goals this year. So I wouldn't be opposed to doing that. My only reluctance comes from having to cut again in all of this expensive hand-dyed, which would make it less reusable, whereas were I to unravel it. And then my third option is to unravel this entire jumper, which I've never done either, is unraveling an entire garment. And again, I would be reluctant into like cutting my Italian bind off, etc. And because it's a drop shoulder, there are a fair amount of, of times where I've cut things. And then just the fact that I had mixed so many of those balls of yarn with the hand dyed, like I will obviously not remember which yarn came from which skein of hand dyed and how to redistribute the speckles nicely. Like it would be a nightmare. I would end up with so many ends. But I, when I was thinking of what to do with this yarn, I kind of always thought I was going to do the Sonia sweater. But I had looked on Ravelry, sorted, like, used the filter to sort patterns by gauge. This was a 17 stitch gauge. And I had shortlisted a bunch of patterns that were using that gauge. So I have options of things that I had already identified would look nice with this yarn. And I think the latest one that I've been quite attracted to is the Drop Sweater by Albiona McLaughlin. I've just finished like a, a beret from her last month and I really liked her pattern writing and I've heard amazing things from her. Ode from Bubbles and Berries has made the Drop Sweater and had really good things to say about it. And I've been thinking that it would be a nice learning opportunity for me to, to actually unravel something and, and do something else if it feels right. So let me know what you think. What option would you go for? Would you just wear it with the sleeves rolled? Would you do the surgery or would you unravel the entire thing? 
For context, this entire sweater, again by the meter, cost me 108 pounds and two peas. So it's over 100 pounds for a sweater, which is double my usual budget, and I really want to be happy with it. Like, I am not going to be happy not wearing this jumper. This cannot be on my flubs video next year. Um, it is really soft. It is quite heavy because it has like a lot of yarn in it, I guess. The sleeves are like half of the weight. Um, it's really soft because it's Surrey Alpaca, which I am totally fine with. And like the colors I really like. I think it's neutral without being boring. And um, it has a lot of ease, even the sleeves being oversized, even if we remove that, the sweater itself has 45 centimeters of ease compared to my bust. It's extremely boxy and shapeless. And maybe if I did the drop pullover by Albiona, I would, again, take a size down. If I were to redo this entire sweater, maybe I would have gone for the extra, extra small. I think I did the extra small for that. Let me check. I did the extra small, so this wasn't even Petit Knit's smallest size. Um, usually I'm a size small, so I had already sized down, and so I should have sized down even more, because this has just way too much ease. So yeah, it's a shame. I was feeling good about this sweater like a week ago, and then now having tried it on, it's just not right at all. So I think that's pretty much everything I want to say. I don't think I need to wax lyrical about this more, but let me know your thoughts on it. And I will definitely be giving it a go this week and wearing it with the sleeves rolled up to see if it's practical. Okay, the next garment is the Sila sweater by Jonah Hietella, uh, who's also the editor of Lina Publishing or Lion Magazine. So the Sila sweater is a oversized raglan and here is the jumper. So it is quite big. I did the size 2, I think my gauge was slightly different than what the pattern called for, so I would end up between size 1 and size 2. Yeah, that's what I said in my notes. So uh, my gauge blocked is pretty much like 13 or 14 stitches. I did this on 5.5 millimeter needles um, and I used Sennes Garn Borste Alpaca. It's just a simple raglan, I think it's got like a 2 stitch raglan on the sides, um, it's got quite a deep armhole if you follow the pattern, which I did. Um, the sleeves have a fair amount of decreases, so they are uh, tapered. You get a normal one by one rib. The bind off was Judy's magic, uh, Judy's surprisingly stretchy bind off. I would not attempt to do the tubular bind off with this yarn, which is extremely like catchy and fuzzy. Uh, and then I cropped it a little bit. There was supposed to be some decreases to like cinch everything before the rib, but I don't really love that look of having like, I feel like like, you know, like the, the muffin look where you have everything really cinched in and then a huge like puff of fabric around, um, like a hot air balloon type thing. I, I didn't want that. So I just um, continued on. You start off with the neck and then you fold it in and then you continue, so I did that. The result is that the neckline is obviously massive, like probably double the size of this one. And you can see in the photos, like it really wants to drop on my body. And I probably could put an elastic. What I think I'll do first is put a crochet reinforcement line of slip stitches, which is something that I've done on one of my sweaters before and I found success with without having to do an elastic, which I'm less comfortable doing. So I might do that, although after doing the photo shoot and wearing this for a day or two, um, I feel like the usefulness of this garment is really going to be like an indoor sweater that you just throw on whatever as a layer of warmth. It's not something that I'm going to try and style per se or make it look trendy. It, it just feels like it's a comfortable sweater, like a pyjama layer, because it's just really shapeless. The yarn I used is Stennis Garn Borste Alpaca. I used just under uh, under five and a half balls, so relatively affordable. In fact, I'll tell you how much it cost right now. It was um, 38 pounds 29. So not the most expensive, not the cheapest, um, just for something held single. I love the shade of blue that I used. This is by far my favorite part about this sweater is the color. And a lot of you have been saying when I share this on my stories or Instagram, um, yeah, the color really suits me, and I'll share a lot of photos here 
on, on the side um, instead of just holding this up. But yeah, um, as you can see in the photos, it, it looks really oversized on me. Um, I quite like the fact that the armholes are so low down. It's really comfortable and it it's not like I can't raise my hands up high. Not that I do that every day anyway. And um, I like the length on me. Maybe next time I could have added some short rows to lower the back a little bit. But I think the, the yarn is really shapeless and thin and, and airy and light. So it, it just doesn't really drape in a nice way, I feel. Like, I wish it had more weight to it so that it'd be brought down. This thing just feels kind of like it clings on your body. Or, like, it... Yeah, it, it just doesn't have much drape. It's, it's weird. There's a video that I'll put as well, so hopefully this kind of shows what I'm talking about. But yeah, it, it's soft as well. I, I would say for someone who's sensitive, I don't know if I would wear nothing underneath. I'd still prefer having something. It's not prickly. Maybe there's like 1% prickliness. It's not completely prick-free. <laughs> um, but it's also n nothing, nothing like mohair or even brushed alpaca per se. Like the brushed alpaca from my like Surrey Sonia sweater. Anyway, um, so I would recommend the yarn. I, I would say you could try it. Definitely don't substitute it for just like anything because you really need to think about what garment would go well with this. So for a simple raglan, no problem, fair enough. Like I don't have anything like that in the wardrobe so it's nice to have something that's like that loose. The, the gauge obviously is very airy and big and, and it's very light. So fair enough, but just be careful if you're going to substitute that for something else. Um, just think twice about it. Um, the yarn is really interestingly in interesting looking. I don't know if you can see at this distance, the this, this stitch definition is basically non-existent. So it kind of looks like something that's machine made or like fleece because it, you can't see the stitches as much. And I do like that. They're very even, even though it was a loose gauge. My rib is not the nicest. Um, but the, the sock in that section is really nice. I don't know if I would use this again, to be perfectly honest. Like, I was kind of thinking of doing the Darling cardigan by Kito Vakika, but I just, I wasn't hugely impressed with this. Like I said, the color is the, is the one thing I enjoy the most, but I don't think I would be rushing to use this yarn again. So I had it in my stash because I wanted to try it and because I, I wanted to see if it was really soft. And so my evaluation is this is like a 7 out of 10 like garment and yarn so I'm happy I have it it was it would have been faster to finish but I was bored out of my mind the um, process the, the the process of this knit it was just really boring for me I definitely am moving away from raglans I just don't find them interesting or enjoyable or stimulating enough for me like fair enough I can do them while watching tv but I think I need something that's just like a little bit more elevated, like at least having a compound raglan or some nice shaping or some nice details, but this was just as basic as you get for a pattern. And it was really well written, no typos, no mistakes that I can see, no typos that I can see, so no fault to the pattern. I should have known what I was getting into, obviously, so uh, I'm not saying that the pattern or the yarn is bad. I think together they go well as well. But um, yeah, it's just next time I probably wouldn't have chosen to go with this pattern. And I had already cast this on in December, if not November. So yeah, I just need to be more mindful of what I cast on next to avoid getting a dozen more of these in the next year. Okay, so I hope that you're still with me. I just had a little drink. Um, I, I guess as a reflect moment. Um, I really like this jumper. I wasn't a huge fan of the latest two jumpers that I've done, but I'm really happy that I finished them because I had casted these on both as part of my winter plans. So it's good to achieve those things. And uh, like I said, now that I really want to slow down this year and understand what I like more, I want to be really mindful of what I decide to cast on next as a garment. Instead of just casting on based on impulse or trends, I want to cast on something that fills a gap or is a technique that I like or is a color that I like etc like I really want to make sure that I commit to things that I will enjoy as opposed to just doing things impulsively so the next items are going to be accessories the first one was a stash busting project it wasn't really 
Oh yeah, it was born out of wanting a matching set of accessories. So I made the penny gloves last month in this minty color um, green cashmere and I thought I had some yarn in stash that looked similar and so because with Ode from Bubbles and Berries we were doing the winter set Cal which is knit along that's ran until the 20th of March where you can make a matching set of accessories based on color or pattern or yarn and so yeah technically the patterns don't look the same they're not the same yarn but i thought they were the same color family so anyway that's why i used this yarn it was leftovers from my mist sketch sweater which was in my flops video which i um really liked the color of so i was excited to use the leftovers so here is the the finished item it's the cutar beret by sari nordland and it is using her cutar motif. She's used it in a top, a t-shirt, a pullover, and a beret, and a hat as of very recently. So if you like the if you like the, the motif and you don't like the beret, there's definitely your pick of the litter. You can choose any other type of knitted item to do to have this nice Japanese lace inspired pattern. And uh, her pattern also normally has a pom-pom, but I'm, I'm not sure I want that. Maybe I'll make a tiny little I-cord pip, uh, or maybe not. But yeah, it's it's really stunning. I, I will show a few photos of it, like, laying flat, because... I mean, no, I'll just show you here. How, how beautiful is this symmetrical, concentric circle? It's really cleverly designed. Um, I like the way that Sari structures her patterns and includes little details. There's an I-cord bind off for the entire thing that is preceded by some twisted rib. Oh, so you can see the twisted rib and an I-cord. Um, I will show a couple of photos of me wearing it and then again this is where I'm not the happiest with it. Um, I think the mistake is on my part though. The last beret I made was the stock and pip beret which was made in a DK BFL Masham yarn which was extremely plump, round, sturdy, self-standing, dense beret. And I really like that. And I've been wearing it and feeling really cool in it. This is made in pretty much all alpaca. It's from Isigur. It's alpaca one, which is a lace alpaca 100%. And then alpaca two, which is 50-50 alpaca and wool. And it's just very floppy. Like, I blocked this over a plate, as recommended. I find that super fun to do. And I put a little video here of um, I took for Instagram, which was really funny because it looked like an optical illusion. Uh, but yeah, you block it over a plate and it keeps its shape. Like, it has this, like, fold line where the, the rim of the plate was. But I don't think it'll keep its shape very much. Like, when you hold it like that, it's just kind of sad. Uh, obviously, before block, it looked nothing like a beret. It was this, like, floppy, round thing. Well, it was on my needles, it looked tiny, and after the fact, I still think it's a little too small and a little bit too tight at the eye cord. I wanted, I actually went down a couple, uh, one needle size and did it on wooden needles just to make sure that I wouldn't get a lace that was massive because I knew that the lace would block out significantly. But maybe I shouldn't have gone down for the eye cord. The process of this, it was not enjoyable at the beginning because you start off here in the middle and you expand it. So at the beginning you're doing it with very few stitches and so you're using magic loop or I did anyway, you could use um, DPNs. Magic loop was not fun, there was a lot of lace, you have to keep your eyes on the pattern. The pattern was fun, more fun to do this time around because it was all in the round. Because when I did my cutar top this summer, the lace panels were both at the front and the back knit flat. And sometimes you had lace on the reverse side and it was just much more hassle having to mentally convert every other row to be the opposite of the previous row. Or I found it definitely more attention taking. Whereas this actually became a little bit more intuitive and almost memorable by the end of it. Then when I was able to finally, finally not use magic loop and use like my circular needles, it was much more fun, really enjoyable, really addictive because you just keep on wanting to reach the next like section of lace. Um, and it is, it is mesmerizing. It is beautiful. I love looking at it. So this is an item that I'm quite proud of for like the worksmanship. Again, like this is something that I think is very impressive looking and it wasn't that hard. I wouldn't say it should be your first lace pattern, but it could be the second one. But it's not an item that I'm going to be rushing to wear all the time because of that floppiness issue. 
and it just has less of a nice shape than my previous beret. So I, I made my first beret, I fell in love with the beret style, I'm trying this style of beret, which is like a floppy one, and I don't like it, and that's fine. I can go back to doing my sturdy berets. There's been a lot of berets that I can see online which are made of a strand of fingering and a strand of mohair, which I think would give you the same fabric as this, which is like fingering and lace as well. And so I personally wouldn't, not that I wouldn't recommend, but I wouldn't go and do a fingering and mohair beret again. <clears throat> I would prefer to use a DK weight yarn to get a sturdier fabric that would keep its shape better. Um, so maybe, again, this could go to a family member if this is their style, or this could just be like as a wall hanging or something because it's just really, really beautiful. Um, the cost of this was £5.44 because it was like leftovers. Uh, it took less than one ball of each, obviously, because like the lace up like it was 400 meters. But I'll put all the actual meterages and everything on Ravelry if you're curious about actual numbers. So I think that's it for the beret. Um, let's move on to an, a next set of accessories. Um, so I've been talking about this for a long time. I have this burak cowl by Mari Wallen, which is my favorite thing in the entire world. <laughs> Probably, I'm not even exaggerating. Uh, and so I wanted to make a matching um, accessory with it, again, in the spirit of our knit along with Aude. And I knew that I would use the same yarn, Jameson of Shetland Spin Rift for ply. They have like hundreds of colors. And I would use a pattern from the same book. This is from Mary Wallen, her book Shetland. And it's the Scary's Mittens. And I have finished them. And I'm just so happy with this. I'll share a few photos that I took of them together. I think there's something just absolutely mesmerizing to have these colors like held together. All this fair isle is just making me so happy because it is a lot of work and I feel like it shows like this looks complicated and time consuming and it was and I'm really proud of it. So I'll, I'll drop the, the cowl because the cowl is not the focus of, of this, but the, the mittens are. So again, to be perfectly honest, these are nicer to look at than they are to, to wear because they're knitted in the round the entire time. Then you reach this section here and you knit flat for like 10 rounds for the thumb opening. Then you join back in the round and then you do your um, edging. Then you pick up some stitches here to do the thumb. So basically there's no thumb gusset. So it doesn't really hug your hand the same way as my <clears throat> beloved penny gloves do. I, I really, really like the fit of my penny gloves. They really like, nicely hug the curve of my thumb and these don't. So when you wear them, first of all, they're really long on the arm. And I think this is because you want them to be really warm. And so you don't want any skin exposed. So yeah, I guess I'll show where they reach. Just a little bit above my elbow. And yeah, as you can see, they just don't really it's okay, like, the thumb placement is okay. I have known of a few people on Ravelry saying that they modified where the thumb placement was, so maybe for me I could have put it a bit lower. Um, I did a couple modifications. First of all, I went down to my 2 point... Let me check. 2.5 millimeter needles for everything, instead of, I want to say 325. Yeah, the original pattern is on 325, but I went on 2.5. I also um, only cast on, I cast on 14 less stitches at the start and I substituted moss stitch for twisted rib. Then on the last round, I increased 14 stitches to get the stitch count of the pattern because otherwise it was just way too flared and I wanted to have a little bit of cinching in at the rib sections. And I did the same at the top here where I then decreased my stitches and did my rib. So that way they're relatively straight, otherwise they would have flared. The other modification I would say is that because you have to purl some color work, which is not fun, I don't think it's anyone's favorite thing to do. Um, I, my first glove, there are a few rounds of just plain stockinette. And unfortunately, a lot of the color work rounds were still done in purling and then the stockinette was done in knitting. And I thought that's a shame because if, if I had done the flat section, like one row below or one row above, that would re inverse itself. And then the stockinette would be done in purling and then the color work would be done in knitting, which was more familiar for me. So for the second glove, 
I just started the color work, I just started the flat section one row above. And so that way, all the plain knit rounds were done like from the wrong side on purling. And then most of the color work rounds were done with the knitting, which I just thought was like just easier and more efficient. So I would recommend doing that. It doesn't make a difference in my two gloves. And then if you're just using this tip, just you can make both of yours match. My favorite color work section is this like purple flower, but sadly it's the one that's like hidden in the coat. I do like everything. Like I really like Mari Wallen's eye for color and combinations. And I would say someone had asked me with the Burra Cowl, if you're planning to buy yarn for this, you only need to buy one ball of camel and one ball of birch to be able to make two with all the leftovers from each other. So yeah, if you're wanting to make a matching thing from that book and not go back to the shop to buy more yarn, if you're like on a trip to Scotland or something, buy one more of camel and one more of birch and you can make both of these projects from those balls of yarn. Uh, apart from that, didn't make any modifications. I'm quite proud of the fact that both mittens are the same size and shape. Usually when I make two of something, or like usually it's mittens, when I make color work mittens, one of them always ends up being huge and the other tiny. My gauge usually changes quite significantly between the two, which is like ridiculous and a shame and not something I can really like go back and fix unless I start over, but then I risk having that third one being a different size also. So I'm happy with these and they're going to be really warm and I'll just shove them in my pocket and yeah, it's just really nice to have mittens because I know that these will be wearable. But I definitely still prefer having some in gusset. I had seen people on Ravelry talk about making the modification to include a gusset and making their own color work chart of how to continue the pattern to, to, to just seamlessly evolve from the established pattern. But it seemed like a lot of work and I wasn't really in the mind to do that. Um, so yeah. Oh, the last thing to mention is that at first I was trying to spit splice my ends, especially if I was going from a straight knit round to another straight knit round in another color, because then I wouldn't have to worry about how many stitches before color work, etc. And so I would just kind of try and spit splice those and, and continue knitting. But I don't know, I might be doing it wrong. It, my yarns always came undone. And I know that Jimison is supposed to be perfect for spit splicing because it's like as rustic wool as you can imagine. Um, but it just really wasn't working. And so that was becoming more of a hassle to do than just having more ends to weave in at the end. So I went back to just having ends to weave in at the end. And if you know me, you know that I've been um, vocalizing my worry about when I have a lot of ends to weave in, especially like all at the beginning of the round, will it leave gaps between stitches at the beginning of the round? Um, and so, yeah, I think this one is okay. It's, it's obviously not the neatest edge ever. So I'll show you. Oh, wow. Okay, the sun is really out. So that's my beginning of the round. And then that's my magic loop end. <laughs> you really can't see much. Um, but yeah, no holes anyway. And if there were any, then the Jemison bloomed and filled them in. So these ended up costing me £4.69 because they pretty much used one and a third of a skein altogether. But all the colors individually were probably just like three or two grams at most, except the birch, the brown color, which was the main color, used more. So yeah, this was quite an economical project. Again, if you have to go out and buy every single color of the Jemison, it will be costly because the bowls are like 350, I think now, um, and you need at least nine colors. But because I already had almost all of these bowls from my Burra Cowl, this was really economical for me. I just had to buy the Camel and the Birch. Um, I think that's it for that one. That was quite a lot of talk. The next one is the Hiedra Headband by Fiber Tales. I had already made this pattern once and I ended up giving it away as a Christmas gift this year. So I made a second version. Uh, again, with leftover yarn, this was from my Sycamore sweater by Petite Knit. The yarn is Isiger Jensen and Isiger Spinny. And I'll put the colors and everything in the description and on Ravelry as always. Um, and I made a couple modifications to this headband. So I will talk about that. I did a slip stitch edge instead of just like the, gar the garter edge that you're meant to get, I put what I did in my description, I can't remember, but basically you slip the 
first stitch and you knit the last or something like that. So that's what I did. Then um, I, I put one more stitch in the middle. So there's two versions of this. There's a thin and a thick one. I did the thick one, but I added one more stitch because I wanted to change the middle cable pattern. Uh, the original one has to do some kind of like knit one, yarn over, knit one in the same stitch, which I was kind of done doing. Uh, it, I don't, it's not my favorite st stitch to do. And last time when I made this cable headband, I didn't enjoy the process. It was just like not mindless. I had to use my cable needle all the time, etc. Um, so I wanted to, to see if I would enjoy this headband more if I changed the cable repeat in the middle. So I did just like a horseshoe thing. It's kind of the same as the, um, what's it called? The um, Higa Season Socks by Sari Nordland that I did last month. So it's like uh, two over two and then two over two cables in the different directions. Um, and everything else I did the same. I cast on normally and then bound off normally. And then at the end, I join the uh, cast on and bind off edges the same way that you would for those twist headbands. So the way that you do it is you kind of like fold one like that, you fold one like that, you put them on top of each other, like an S shape kind of. Then you take your needle and you like zigzag sew this shut so that the needle goes through all four layers. I think that's the best I can explain it. There's a lot of free tutorials for headbands like that. You can just like steal that finishing step from the instructions. Uh, and I was totally inspired by Ode from Bubbles and Berries. She made this some time ago and she had done that twist because it was easier to wear with a ponytail when you put that at the back of your neck. So I put some photos here of what it looks like worn both ways with the knot at the top and then the knot at the bottom. Not a huge fan of this on me. I think it makes me look like an egg when all my hair is pulled back, but I think it'll be very useful. So again, I'm going to keep this in my little box of accessories near the door where if I am going out for the day or for a trip or for a walk, uh, my ears get cold so easily and I get headaches. So it's very important for me to keep warm uh, and covered. So um, yeah, I think this will be very useful to have. To the question, did changing the middle cable pattern make this easier to do and more fun? No, it did not. I still was dragging my feet taking way too long to finish this. This could have been done in like two days, but it took me like over a week because I, I didn't enjoy doing it. But um, it, it really isn't just anything but me being fussy about, um, I guess because you always have to turn, like the rows are small, so it kind of breaks your rhythm having to always flip the, the thing. Uh, but the pattern is very easily mem memorable. So uh, yeah, and then no cable needle for that one. So at least it was a little bit more portable the little side lateral braids shrink significantly. So um, the pattern tells you how many repeats you want, but I'd recommend just having another headband or like having your head circumference. I think mine is like, let's say 20 inches. It might be wrong, but let's say 20 inches. I would want my headband to then be 18 inches to have negative ease. So just make sure that maybe you make your headband 19 or 20 inches because then the braids will shrink it back to 18. So you have to do a little bit of thinking ahead and you may have to block it and, and just keep in mind, you may have to adjust it before you sew things together. Like just make sure that you know what length circumference you want before you commit to sewing it shut. And the total cost for this was seven pounds 37, which is like, a little much, or like a little bit more for an accessory compared to like the Kutar Beret or the Scary's Mittens. Um, and this is because it's it's a year yarn, so it's a bit more pricey. But um, yeah, I don't find it too rustic or too itchy. I think it's okay, but I'm not one to be too bothered by itchy wools on my forehead. Um, other parts of my body are more sensitive to, to rustic yarn. So yeah, I don't know if I would necessarily recommend this yarn, for a headband, but it's what I had in the stash and I'm happy to have used it because I had just the right quantity. Okay, another project that I finished is a little Audrey 2 plant and crochet. So I'll really, really briefly talk about that. But basically uh, with my boyfriend, we went to see the Little Shop of Horrors, a production made in Edinburgh by um, a student society. Uh, it was really, really fun. It was perfect. I was so happy we were able to find tickets. And so I, I put it in my mind that I wanted to, to bring a little prop to the show. So I found this pattern on Etsy and I'll link it below. 
uh, and it's for little baby Audrey too. Um, so it has quite a, a lot of details, which is why I liked the pattern, even though it's quite a simple shape. So you have this bud, then you have a stem, two leaves, um, and then a little um, like mud thing. And then I put it in a pot, which, I mean, how perfectly fitting is that size? As you can see, it's been an hour filming. I'm out of words. It also has some veins that you uh, like sort of embroider on it beforehand, before you sew those leaves. So it's got like some purple veins coming from the plant, which I really like. Then I made a slip stitch chain and then I sewed that on the bud. It is stuffed with polyfill stuffing and it has a dowel in the stem because the head is really heavy so it wouldn't be able to support itself from just like fabric and it has cardboard in the mud so lots of little details which made this more assembly focused rather than crochet focused the pattern is for DK but I used Aran I had stash from my crochet days so that was quite fun in retrospect maybe my purple could have been a bit darker but like I use I use what I had so I'm not mad uh, I brought it to the show and it was really fun and um, it, it felt really nerdy to, to like bring a prop or something it's kind of like cosplaying like when you really like something it's like almost like an homage that you want to do to that thing by by making something with your own hands that represents your love for the um, the song or the film or the musical so yeah, um, I wouldn't rush to make a second one. I think the pattern was fine. Um, I have another pattern in my library that's like a, an adult Audrey 2, which is like massive. Um, one day, I think I would really like actually to, to try and attempt to make it, even though it'll be so much more time assembling everything. But it would be a really nice thing to, to then be able to show like baby Audrey 2 and then adult Audrey 2 later. But I don't think it'll be anytime soon. I, I like crochet and I would like to continue making it. I just prefer knitting so much more. So yeah, I just thought that if you guys like crochet, you might like to see that sometimes I, I do it. And if you like Little Shop of Horrors, then um, yeah, you could have your own little Audrey too. Okay, so uh, that's everything for, for me that I've made for me. Uh, I have done three more things, which are two pairs of penny gloves and then one um, grow hat for my grandma. So I will leave you now and I will show future Venetia talking about those projects and what else I'm going to give to my parents when they come to visit. And then afterwards you can join me back here to talk about my whips and future cast on plans and like finishing up and everything. So yeah, I hope that you enjoyed that quick little um, update on gift knittings. Hi everyone, just wanted to quickly show you what I'm going to give my parents when they come to visit. I don't trust the postal service anymore so um, having them come over was a really good opportunity for me to make gifts for the whole family so they can go and redistribute them. So I'll go really quickly because there's not that much to say but I wanted to document this process anyway. So I made a couple more pairs of penny gloves. I also brought out my own pairs. So here are my four pairs of penny gloves. I made this grey pair for my mum, I made this in Drops Flora and the only modification that I did compared to my usual pattern is that I lengthened the wrist and I also lengthened the hand portion and I also made these wider because my mum said that she probably had a hand circumference bigger than mine. So as you can probably see from this pair, it is quite different. So I really hope that they fit her and that she likes them. Then I made a, a cashmere pair and this I used Lang yarn cashmere instead of the Cardiff cashmere that I used for this pair of penny gloves and I must say I really cannot tell a difference between the two different cashmeres. They're relatively the same price points. I was able to get this cashmere on sale at Lovecraft. I think I was able to get 20 or 30% off, which is really good. So um, if you have access to Lovecraft and they stock it in your country, keep an eye on this yarn. It's really good. They have a nice color selection. And because I already knew my stitch counts and row counts for this pair, I was able to make so much use out of my one ball. And I was able to use all of my cashmere for this pair. Um, in fact, I actually ran out of yarn while binding off. 
this one so I had to snip a little bit of my cast on tail because I had um, longer than this I had not estimated really well the long tail cast on so I snipped off this end and then I was able to use that one to bind off so I used literally 25 grams of cashmere for this and I really love them I think that the black or charcoal color is stunning and as you can see from my other pairs I don't have one that is this dark yet so I think my next pair of penny gloves for myself will be a copy of those ones but I'll be giving these away and then the last thing that I made is this grow hat by Fiber Tails. So um, I made a big modification to this hat is that I added one extra repeat of the whole chart. The chart contains one big tree and one small tree. So um, yeah, I added one repeat, which obviously increased my cast on stitches. Uh, I followed that recommendation from pretty much half of the Ravelry projects. And I also added a few more I added one more inch of ribbing, I think, a couple more rounds of plain stockinette and a couple more rows of stockinette before starting the decreases. But all of that will be documented in my Ravelry project page. I use a tubular cast on, which I think is really effective at creating a nice rolled edge like that. Um, the ribbing, because it's turned inside out, is quite neat on the wrong side. This is my right side of the ribbing, it's not that nice. Uh, and as always, I struggle a little bit to block hats without creating fold lines, but I think this hat is really beautiful. Um, I don't know if I've said it, but this is for my grandma. She had let me know that a white hat would be something that she'd like from me. She doesn't feel like she deserves a sweater, even though I obviously disagree and I would be willing to make one for her. Um, she feels more ready to accept accessories. So... That's it for things I've made this uh, last three weeks. So we've got those two pairs and then the hat. I've also made this hat for my dad some time ago, which you have seen. And because I thought it was lost in the post, I ended up making an exact copy. So we have two of these now. And he asked me to embroider a Canadian flag on this one so I could give it to his friend. And then they're going to have matching Oslo hats with different country flags on them. So I just need to do this. Um, I... I'm obviously going to be doing red, white, red the same way that I did this with the plicket stitch. I don't know how I'm going to be doing the little leaf for the Canadian flag, but I'll figure this out later. And then what else will be included in their parcel? Well, if you've seen my flops video, you'll know that I have a few sweaters that I don't have a use for, that I don't find myself wearing, and my mom has indicated that she would have a place for them. So the three sweaters that she will be leaving with are the... Northwood V-neck by Jessie Maid Design. This was made with a lot of yarns from my stash. I just find that I don't wear it. I don't think it's my colors. Um, so yeah, I would like to remake one for myself in colors that I prefer. Then she will also take the Pictus Pullover by Tetis Knit Garden. Again, not my color, very autumnal, a little too scratchy, way too cropped for me. Um, but I did quite like the circular yoke and the neckline on me. And then the last thing that my mom will be taking with her is the April cardigan by Petite Knit. And this is, again, not my color, but it is definitely something that I want to re-knit for myself. I adored this jumper, uh, as you can tell from the episode. I also love the saddle shoulder contiguous sleeve construction, so I really want to give this another go. Next time I probably will do the double knit button band that a lot of people have done. And I think I'm just going to be doing it in a strand of DK. Maybe something from um, Send This Garn in Double Sunday. Or maybe something that has like merino and silk for extra coziness and softness. Uh, so here's the last documentation of me having those things with me at the moment. Hope that that was interesting. Bye! Okay. So the other two projects that I have finished, but I can't show you right now, there's the Levi Pullover by Sari Nordland. It's blocking right now and it is really wet and heavy. So I am not taking that off of the blocking mats and there's no time anyway. So I will show that in the next podcast episode and I think it will just do it more justice to have the time it deserves and to really show it off. So I will show that later, although I might put a little sneak peek of what it looked like before block and it did change a lot after blocking. So yeah, here's the Levi Pullover. And then the next finished item, which I will also talk about in the next podcast, 
again because one of them isn't done blocking, but it's my uh, Field of Sunflower Socks by Charlotte Stone from Sto like Stone Knits. And um, I've done this one which is finished and blocked, and I've just finished this one which is obviously unblocked, and I still need to duplicate stitch the um, brown, not stem, center, hearts, what's it called? Okay, whatever. Venetia will... Editing Venetia will put it in the middle here. Uh, but yeah, so I will show these off in the next episode as well. But um, it just meant that they're off the needles and my needles are just so free right now. So the two things I have on the needles right now, um, there's my sweater number 23, which is part of my pomegranate cal knit along, which is hosted on Discord. Check the link below with Tangerin Knits Ichi. And this is finishing on the 12th of February. So you still have a couple of like you have a bit of time to participate if you want, although it needs to be a finished item. But if you have a finished item in red that you've made this month or last month, definitely check out the Discord and put your FO in the channel. So here's my sweater number 23. That This was where I left it last time, I think, but I've now made an entire sleeve. So yeah, and the reason I haven't been working on this a lot is because I'm wanting to film a tutorial for the neck. So that's why I've not I've not been I've not been working on this, but I will I will do it really soon. Maybe today, probably not today, but uh, I mean no yeah anyway. Uh, I just I just need to find a way to film it. And then the last thing on my needles, or second thing on my needles, is what I cast on yesterday uh, as finally a huge reward for for finishing everything that I had on the needles. And this is um, the U Urania cardigan by Sari Nordland from her book Softly, Timeless Knits. And I showed the swatch for that a couple episodes ago, uh, which is made of um, Knitting for Olive Merino and Camaro's Midnight Soul. It's a really nice navy blue. Um, yeah, the sun is not our friend here. So I, I cast this on, and I thought that this was going to be just a normal drop shoulder, but it's actually not at all. Um, I don't know what it's called, but... Uh, I'll talk about this in the next podcast episode, but this is funny because I cast this on because I needed some TV knitting and it turned out it's not mindless at all. There are so many increases to keep track of, like you have to increase different things at different rates. There's a cable going on. So I'll show you what I have on the needles because I'm really proud of it and I'll talk about that in the next podcast episode. So here's what we've got. You can see that nice cable here at the top. It looks really good. It's symmetrical. There's like a nice little trick in the middle here to get it to be as seamless as possible. And then you can see I'm increasing here for the shoulders. So this will be um, the back of the cardigan like this. So we really don't have much at all, but it's been nice seeing the cable form uh, in that yarn and trying a new construction technique and to be doing one of those things that I've been really looking forward to casting on so it feels so rewarding that I'm finally able to do it. Then the next thing is that I've swatched for my beret number three by My Favorite Things Knitwear. I'm hoping to finish that by the end of the knit along because it's red for my pomegranate cal. I'll show a photo here of before felting and then after felting, so uh, you can see the photos here, and here's my little swatch now. This is after going in the washing machine um, for just a cycle on 40 degrees Celsius with a bunch of other things in the washing machine, so like just a regular wash. And I still think you can see too many stitches, so I will be putting it in another wash to try and felt it more. And then when I'm happy with that, I will then cast on the beret there are three different sizes. I'm not too sure what I should go for. I think I will make size one or two. I, I'm trying to think, would I be more upset with a too small beret or a too big beret? But uh, yeah, I just wanted to show you that I finally did this. I fell to the swatch. I, I said in my, in my goals before, that was a goal from last year. And um, I really just wanted to, to do it uh, now because there's no reason to wait. Um, so that's what I'm going to cast on next. And then the other thing I'm going to cast on is um, another Fair Isle accessory. I've been loving the color work. I love doing color work in Jemisons of Shetland Spinrift. It's my favorite color work yarn ever to work with. 
I like working in fingering weight. I love seeing how it blooms. And I love Mary Wallen's patterns. And uh, I already had half of the colors. I just had to buy the other half. So it doesn't feel like a huge financial commitment because I am using my leftovers and scraps from previous yarns and, and, and slowly growing my stash of Jameson's colors. And one day I'll have a whole rainbow of them. I mean, I probably already do. Uh, I'll put here below how many colors of Jameson's I have. But uh, here's my little box of the colors I've selected or that are from the pattern. This is for the Fetlar Scarf by Mari Wallen. Same again, it's from the book Shetland. I'm definitely making the most use of that book, which wasn't even expensive at all. Um, so yeah, here's the colors. There's actually one more, which is uh, Burnt Ochre. So those are the colors that are going to be in the scarf. And I was just really waiting to, to cast off a bunch of projects so that I could have time to focus on this. It will have a lot of ends needing weaving in. It's a scarf and I plan on it. I intend on, on adding one more repeat to it. So it will definitely be um, time intensive, but I'm looking forward to it. I think what I'll do is I'll periodically weave in the ends as we go. It's a scarf that's made in the round. So it's always obviously then no knitting flat, but it just means that there's double the amount of knitting to do because it's like double thickness. And those are my favorite scarves, like the tube scarves I really like. And the way that it ends is it's just a straight edge. Like you just cast it on in the round, then you can like graft the, the, the end shut. And there's no pom-poms or tassels or anything. So I think that that's fine. I was considering maybe doing like the Judy Magic cast on. So that you already start off with it being sewn shut. But I think I like the idea of not doing that to allow me to change my mind later if I wanted to do a different type of binding off or edging. So I will do it as the pattern calls for. So that's what I'm going to be casting on really, really soon and I'm, and I'm super excited for it. And then the last thing that I'm about to cast on, I've been teasing it on my Instagram, but basically I've been selected for another test net by Rebecca from the Crea Bea and it is for her louder pattern. I've only applied for the vest. I didn't want to do the sweater or the cardigan. It was a lot of work. So I've swatched with a wooly knit merino held double which was my intention like from the start to no my intention was to do a, a mohair and merino vest but um i swatched and it wasn't working at all i, I don't even have to swatch anymore so then I, I was panicking i was like what do i have in stash and i had this cone of gray but i didn't like it for a couple of reasons first of all i thought it might be too marled and so that would hinder the cables and then second of all, I thought that the wooly net, as good as it is for other things, is a little too stringy and not round enough to give the cables a good definition. So I don't know how this swatch is going to come out on camera. It was much better after blocking, like this wool blooms and plumps up during block. Not like as much as the Jimison, but it does change with blocking. Um, so it is be better after block, but I still wasn't feeling hugely confident or happy with this. And I really wanted to feel more excited about, about the project before casting on. I looked at my stash. I had a lot of different options. Most of them I was feeling lukewarm about. So I decided to break my rule and buy some yarn. Um, even though I was really wanting to only test knit if I had the yarn in stash. So I was really falling in love with one of the contrast colors I used for my Levi pullover, the Limpopo color. And I, again, have a rule where I don't like to buy the same yarn color twice because why waste an opportunity when there's so many different colors that you could try, blah, blah, blah. But I decided to not be stupid. And if I like the color so much, like just use it. So it's kind of a neutral color, but it's a little bit more fun. And it's like this, and it's kind of like a, a, a cold, brown gray it really depends on the light I think this is pretty accurate um, it's kind of medium dark it's not too dark that you can't see anything and actually I have a swatch so let me just go and get that and yeah I thought that this would be a cute color for a vest it would look nice and contrasting if I had a white t-shirt maybe a gray t-shirt or also just like a nice like dress up button up shirt um, I think it looks good to have some something dark over dark shirts. I don't know what I'm saying. I, I just think that this would be a nice color that would go with a lot of things I already have. Um, and and I'm really, really happy with Phil Klana's, like Peruvian Highland wool 
look for cables. I think they're definitely rounder and plumper than the Merino held double from Willy Net and I can meet Gage. I think this was actually also the yarn that Rebecca used in her sample, so not feeling hugely creative there. Um, but yeah, I've also been really itching to cast this on, but I was wanting to cast off other projects first. So I think that's everything for the future plans. I, I guess I wanted to touch on the fact that, I don't know, if you're watching this video and you're thinking, how does she have 12 finished objects in a month? I, I really want to emphasize that like, mo all of the garments I finished, I had cast on previously. This was just a month of finishing them. The accessories, I cast on a lot of them um, this month, but then they were quite fast and, and I was kind of on the time crunch because I wanted to finish them before my parents arrived. So I know I said I wanted to slow down and it looks like I didn't, but in my books I did because what I did slow down was yarn buying. Um, I really didn't purchase much this month. I bought like the louder vest quantity. I bought a little bit of cashmere for the gloves. So uh, the stash I bought, I'm using it straight away. I still have an output of yarn that's bigger than my input, which is my goal for the end of the year is to be net negative. So that goal has been completely met this year. And then I slow down casting on, which for me was a problem again with the impulsing and, and uh, like feeling too inspired by Instagram to just do what's trendy. Um, and this, because I was refraining from casting on any new garments until I finished my big pile of whips, this gave me so much time to really mindfully think about what I do want to cast on next and what I want to, to be committing to. So I made a little short list of the things that I consciously wanted to do and, and had been for a while and like the reasons why I wanted to cast on those ones and not other ones. And I'm really happy and feel confident that the things that I have shortlisted here, so like the test net, the cardigan, the colorwork scarf, and then the beret, all of these I, I chose so purposefully to be my next like generation of cast-ons. And then I will really try and do the same for the next things that I cast on. I want to make sure that they're garments that I'm not doing for no reason. I really want to have a reason why I cast on these ones in the future. So I've been feeling really good about my choices. I feel really proud of the way I've, I've been taking my knitting this month. I don't think I want to wait another three weeks before doing the podcast again. That felt stressful for me. I put on my Instagram whether you guys wanted me to just like skip some and not talk about them all together. Like I could have just not talked about that, for example. But very overwhelm overwhelmingly, um, like 500 people voted for like show everything, show everything. And I did. And it's it was making me not want to film today as much because I, I just was wondering how am I going to be able to concisely talk about everything and here it's I don't even know how long it's been I feel like I've not rambled too much and I got all the information out that I wanted to but it's definitely a skill and it is more hard work to talk about your knits in a meaningful way um it's not just turning on the camera and then blabbering on. I feel like this was definitely like a, a harder video to film because there was so much to talk about um, and so many knits. So yeah, uh, I want to knit less items because otherwise it's hard to talk about in the podcast. So I think doing those complex knits with cables and everything and, and complex constructions will be a good way to make sure there's not too many finished items in the podcast. But let me know your thoughts on that. Um, I'm really open to constructive criticism and just like your opinions because you're the one watching so it's your experience watching. I guess I was biased by my poll on Instagram. What does YouTube think? Would you guys have preferred me to to not talk about all of my items this week and save some for like later but then we risk things like piling up or just skip things altogether or just always talk about everything. Do you mind videos being two hours long? Do you get bored after one hour? Um, yeah, and, and what do you think about all of those items? Like, did it overwhelm you? Was this video overwhelming for you? Because it was a little bit for me. Um, but I still feel good about having shown you everything. I think that this episode probably was interesting, I think, because of all of the kind of points that I raised about fit and 
oversize and taking your time to, to pick patterns and things that didn't work out and, and yarn choices for certain projects. I feel like it was an episode that was full of like discussion points, I guess. And it wasn't just like blah, blah, blah about nothing. So yeah, um, I think that's it for me. Uh, Life-wise, everything is going well. Um, it was it was a good month. I know people sometimes don't love January. I quite enjoyed it. I know it was long, but I quite enjoyed that as well because I'm not like that looking forward to summer and spring. Like last year, I think I preferred like the winter months as opposed to the summer months. Um, so yeah, I, I'm kind of wanting to cling on to to winter for longer. And. Uh, yeah, so, so I didn't mind uh, January being long. Um, I've been cooking and baking a lot. I made a cheesecake the other day, which was really nice and rewarding. Um, we've been going out a lot. Like, we've been to some nice dates and restaurants and seeing the little shop of horrors. So, yeah. Um, yeah, we had our anniversary. Did I do a podcast episode before then? Hmm. Don't know. No, I don't think I had podcasted since. So yeah, we, we, we celebrated our, our anniversary um, in Edinburgh and that was really lovely. So yeah, we've been having a really good time and I hope that you have been too. So that's it for me. I'll maybe see you next week for a video. Uh, my parents are visiting, so I'm not sure. And I'll definitely see you in a couple of weeks with a regular podcast episode, episode 25. And remember, if you want to win a copy of a pattern from Crea then let me know in the comments which pattern you'd like to receive. And I'll see you all later. Bye, take care.